This was definitely not a vintage Alabama defense we saw in 2013. Specifically, we saw that against the better offenses. Of course, Johnny Manziel at College Station, 49-42. And then late in the season in the last two games when, when Auburn made some plays in a 31-30 win, that historic uh, game in the Iron Bowl. And then an Oklahoma offense that was inept at times, uh, making some plays and scoring 45 points, 45-31 in the Sugar Bowl. The rest of the time, though, Alabama really clamped down on some teams, uh, most in particular a very talented LSU club with uh, two NFL wide receivers and Jeremy Hill uh, at tailback with Zach Hemettenberger pulling the trigger. So that was an impressive showing, the, the showing and the shutout against Ole Miss, but not vintage Alabama defense, but tons of talent nevertheless, and we see it again. Moving on to the NFL another season here in Tuscaloosa, and we bring in Stephen M. Smith to talk about the tide. Of course, Stephen writes for his site, Touchdown Alabama, as well as contributions for Planet Weekly and also the Houndstooth. They're down in uh, Alabama. Stephen M., thanks so much for joining us, sir. Uh, no, Brock, it's always a joy to be a guest on your show. Definitely. This is good stuff. Let's talk about this Alabama defense with spring football starting. And, uh, again, I don't know that uh, Nick Saban compliments uh, too many players uh, you really need to excel not just as a player but as a smart player to impress this coach and C.J. Mosley was able to do that. I think I heard Nick Saban compliment C.J. Mosley in the last few years just about as much as any player that's ever played for Alabama or even Michigan State or LSU where Nick Saban has uh, had 10 years there. C.J. Mosley again led the Crimson Tide with 108 stops in 2013, nine tackles for loss, but beyond the numbers, made the heady plays, barely took a false step, knew exactly what the offense was doing, it seemed, most of the time, and just a really smart, instinctive player. So talk about C.J. Mosley's contributions, and again, we're spinning this forward. How are they going to make up for the loss of Mosley? Well, when you get C.J. Mosley, Mark, you, you talk about he's the alpha male of the Alabama defense. You mentioned he had 108 tackles this past season. He had 99 tackles last season. Just a smart, very instinctive player, can shoot the gap, whether it be the A gap, B gap, or the C gap, can break down and make tremendous tackles in the run game. Not, he's not known as a pass rusher, but with his long arms can – with his narrow sideline to sideline quickness, can really play well and pass coverage. And just his leadership, his ability that when he walks to the room, people respect him. And that's what Alabama and head coach Nick Saban loves about him. People respect him. He earned the respect of his, of his teammates. He earned the respect of the coaching staff. He's a flat-out stud. He's a flat-out player. He has done a tremendous job on defense, helping Alabama get to a number one ranked defense in two of the three two of the three seasons he has started at that linebacker position for the Alabama Crimson Tide. Now, players that may try to step up and replace him next season, one of them is going to be Trey DePriest. Trey DePriest played a, a lot at middle linebacker this past season. He played right with C.J. Mosley. Trey DePriest. Trey DePriest at 6'2", uh, 270 pounds, really big guy, really played that Mike linebacker position well. A little bit more of a hard hit than C.J. Mosley is, and with a little bit more weight than C.J. Mosley has, he can, Trey DePriest can really rush the passer. He can really stuff the run. Not that much of a play coverage linebacker as C.J. Mosley was, but Trey DePriest can really stuff the run and get after the opposing quarterback. Alabama also has Reuben Foster returning. He the, the upside on him is just tremendous. He's, had, he has, he's got a motor that never stops going. He can get after the passer as well and can really stop the run. Uh, the Alabama staff, uh, head coach uh, Nick Saban and Kirby Smart, they're very high on Dylan Lee next season. He is a man on special teams, a headhunter, a guy that the coaching staff is very high on, the players love, can get down the field, make stops on special teams, and can really be that vocal leader on defense from the linebacker position. He can go in, break down, create tackles in the run game, can really get after the quarterback, can really sack some quarterbacks in that backfield, and can really make life difficult in offenses. And, of course, you have Reggie Ragnar returning. You have Xavier Dixon returning. So there's a lot of, of linebackers returning that can really fill in the gap that C.J. Moses is leaving behind. When you talk about a playmaking linebacker that just jumps off the page at you, it's C.J. Mosley with his instinctive leadership, 
his wisdom and his ability to break down plays game in and game out every day. Adrian Hubbard did not necessarily jump off the page, uh, but a very productive player. Again, not uh, at the level of a C.J. Mosley, but a guy that's gotten a lot of playing time at Alabama in, in recent years and been a starter uh, for most of that time. Adrian Hubbard's loss, uh, you talked about a lot of the replacements along the linebacking core. Anything else to add in regards to uh, what Alabama does uh, in replacing another linebacker? Well, when you talk about Adrian Hubbard, Mark, you look at two things. He was brought in, Adrian Hubbard, at 6'6", 260 pounds. He was brought in as that pass rusher. I remember in 2011, Alabama had, of course, Courtney, um, Courtney Upshaw and Dante Hightower. Those two guys were the pass rush specialists for the Alabama Crimson Tide. And when those two guys left to pursue the NFL, Alabama – needed that pass rush guy. So they went out and brought in Adrian Hubbard. They thought Adrian Hubbard would be the guy his freshman season. They had the team with seven sacks. Kind of took a step back these past two seasons, but really has that speed. He has the, the height. He has that wing span, he can really get after the quarterback. He saw in the 40-yard dash at the combine, ran a 4.69, which is very impressive for a guy his size. With Adrian Hubbard, the question is, can he have that intensity and can he have that passion on the field when he goes to the NFL? Now, going to guys that Alabama has recruited in the recruiting class that may replace him, you look at a guy like Rashawn Evans, very real linebacker coming out of Auburn High School, ranging linebacker, can really break down and make tackles in space, can really get out for the quarterback, and can really, as well as get a stopping game. And it's not just Rashawn Evans. You have a Christian Michael back there. You have Sean Dion Hamilton back there. So Alabama has recruited some guys that can come in and fill the hole that Adrian Hubbard's leaving behind. But I think Adrian, Adrian Hubbard did a fine job here at the University of Alabama. Just didn't mold in that elite pass rusher that fans wanted him to be. But as far as him in the combine, he really showed some NFL scouts that his stock is worth having. Hey, Stephen M., I got to ask you there can't be a better name than Ha Ha Clinton Dix. And he was such a talent that he almost matched the name. I'm not going to say that he matched that name because it's the best name in college football. That, that's my one-man poll, say, best name in college football, ha-ha, Clinton Dix. But this guy, I expect him to be a very productive NFL player, and he certainly was a guy that uh, quarterbacks didn't want to throw to and could support the run uh, there at Alabama. Well, Mark, he more than just his name. Ha-ha, Clinton Dix, you talk about an instinctive, hard-hitting ball skill safety you have in Ha Ha Clinton Dix. And it also doesn't hurt that he comes from one of the best defensive minds in the country in Nick Saban. Nick Saban prides himself on getting the best cornerbacks and the best safeties. He, Nick Saban wants his guys to not only be able to tackle well in space, but also to play the ball in the air correctly. And that's exactly what Ha Ha Clinton Dix did in his tenure at the University of Alabama. He broke down in space and made tackles. He played the ball correctly in the air. Wasn't the fastest guy in the world, but he had great coverage skills. He was a roller in that secondary. He did an outstanding job of getting everybody set on defense. He did a great job of either knocking the pass down or, if he could, cut underneath and either make the interception or deliver a crushing hit on the opposing receiver. Ha Ha Clinton Dix is an absolute stud. And what I love about him is his study of the game. He understands how to play over the top. He understands how to undercut, get his left cleat in that ground, and make a play on the ball. But he also understands when there's a run play going on to step up in the box and deliver a hard hit on the ball carrier. He has such an array of skill and talent around him. And what separates Clinton Dix from most safeties, most safeties often specialize in just one area, whether it's playing the run or whether it's just playing the pass. With Ha Ha Clinton Dix, he specializes in both areas. Now, my issue with him, he tends to get a little over-aggressive at times, and that may hurt him. But if he continues to just read the plays as they dissect down and let the game continue to come to him, I honestly feel like Ha Ha Clinton Dix is going to be a gamer 
in the National Football League. Now the players that Alabama have recruited to replace him, you got to you got to look at Landon Collins return next season. Last season, Landon Collins was just a tremendous player. He merged onto the scene. I remember in 2011 when when uh, Collins was recruited out of Louisiana, and in the 2011 Under Armour All America game, he's there not too happy with Landon's decision to come to Alabama. Of course, she's probably happy with it right now. Landon Collins comes to the University of Alabama and really makes a name for himself, especially in the Arkansas game when Vinny Sinceri went down. Landon Collins had five tackles in that football game. But the Tennessee game, oh my goodness, steps in front of a wobbly Justin Worley pass, picks it off, and takes it 89 yards to the house. Landon Collins, an amazing safety, can really deliver the big time. He can play the ball well, can uh, really take away an opponent's best receivers. And it's not just Landon Collins. You have Landon Collins. You have Eddie Jackson coming back. You have Geno Smith coming back. Bradley Hilby. Alabama's also recruited Tony Brown, a five-star guy. Also, Marlon Humphrey is a five-star five -star guy. And let's not forget Lawrence Hootie Jones, who's going to remind a lot of people of Mark Barron and his ability to play the ball well and to make hard, punishing blows on opposing receivers. But uh, with, with the loss of Ha Ha Clinton Dix, it's going to leave a mark on Alabama because of his role and what he did on the Crimson Tide, defending the back part and with that secondary. But I feel like with Landon coming back, Geno Smith, uh, Bradley Sylvie, of course, Eddie Jackson, and the recruits Marlon Humphreys, Tony Brown, and Lawrence Hootie Jones, I feel like Alabama has a still a special, legitimate secondary returning for Nick Saban. I don't think there's any question about that. You just named off a ton of four- and five-star recruits for this Alabama secondary. I don't know how they're going to play all those guys. There's going to be guys sitting on the bench that could be starting for half the teams in the SEC, let alone 80% of the teams in other conferences in college football. When we look at Benny Sanceri, that guy doesn't necessarily have the measurables of all the guys you just mentioned. This is not a guy that was, was an elite recruit, but uh, the measurables aren't going to be there in regards to a 40-yard time or a, a high-pointing the football, anything like that. But when you talk about a smart, heady player who uh, really commanded that backfield from the safety position, of course had an important pick six in the opener against Virginia Tech. And um, just a guy, unfortunately, in that senior season uh, succumbed to injuries and, and didn't play most of his senior season. But Vinny Sinceri just, just missed in the locker room period. Mark, when you talk about Benny Sinceri, it's the tale of two swords. The first sword is the unfortunate injury. I, I really expected Benny Sinceri to come back for his senior season and really make a case for how strong the Alabama secondary really could be because before his injury, the guy was third the team in tackles at the time. And as you mentioned, he really had a huge game against Virginia Tech picking off uh, Hokies quarterback Logan Thomas and taking it 38 yards for a touchdown, and not even that interception. If you watch the Virginia, the Texas A&M game against Johnny Manziel, really read the eyes of Manziel on that play, and uh, Benny Sinceri and teammate Jarek Williams played a little tip drill there as Jarek Williams tip, tipping the ball in the air, and Benny Sinceri coming down with the football, but not just coming down with it having the presence of mind to use your eyes to set up the convoy of blockers in front of you, uh, put a little juke move there on Johnny Manziel, and taking the ball 73 yards for a touchdown. Benny Sinceri was truly missed in the secondary for his leadership, his ball IQ, his ability, like Ha Ha Clinton Dix, to get everybody deep and set and ready for the task at hand for the play that was going to be called by the opposing offense. And when you look at Sanceri, he's a coach's kid. Sal Sanceri did a phenomenal job mentoring his son, mentoring Benny Sanceri, and getting him prepared to play defensive style football. Benny Sanceri, very knowledgeable of the game. Very strong guy, understands what to do to get the job done. Still felt like he should have came back for his senior season to really make a case for this Alabama secondary. But when you have coaches and 
administrating staff telling you you can go in the NFL as a fifth, sixth, or seventh round pick, many guys are going to jump at the bit and take that opportunity to get that cash and to get that NFL experience. So Benny Sinceri will go to the NFL. I kind of see him as a fifth to seventh round pick. There's been talk that the New England Patriots can take him at the seventh round pick. Uh, of course, Sal Sinceri, very close, very close with the uh, New England coach. Bill Belichick and the owner Robert Kraft and that staff and that uh, staff there. So there could be a possibility that Benny Sinceri could go late in the draft to the New England Patriots. Will he do that? Uh, nobody knows as of right now. But I really feel like Benny Sinceri will make a great case for himself in the NFL. Replacements for Benny Sinceri for the Alabama Crimson Tide going in the next year. Uh, some of the same guys I've just mentioned. Uh, Landon Collins will be a great replacement. Uh, Eddie Jackson, Bradley Sylvie, of course, Geno Smith, and the five-star recruits, Tony Brown, Marlon Humphreys, and uh, Lawrence Hootie Jones. These guys will all come in. Don't know if they'll play, but they'll all come in willing and ready to make a statement to really – Fill in the gaps that Sinceri and Ha Ha Clinton Dix no leave behind. And I'm only half kidding, Stephen M., when I talk about uh, and make the comment that uh, Vinny Sinceri might have seen better talent in a defensive backfield at Alabama that he will in an NFL camp. And I'm only half kidding because my point is there's no question I am never going to make the case that college players can play with NFL players. But if you're just looking at talent and sheer potential, all those guys being four- and five-star recruits, you could make a case that uh, Vinny Sinceri might have a better shot at uh, maybe a little bit of playing time with an NFL team and certainly could get that shot on special teams as well. You mentioned the play he made against Johnny Manziel. Uh, people look at that score at 49-42 and don't really understand that uh, A&M came out fired up, amped up by the crowd, threw a couple touchdowns on Bama, 14-0, then that game spin it ahead to the fourth quarter, and it's 42-21. I know it finished 49-42, but the Crimson Tide basically had that thing salted away at 42-21. So they went on a like 42-7 run to put that thing away. So that that Alabama defense really locked down Manziel from about mid first quarter to early fourth quarter in that game. They did a phenomenal job of that, Mark, and that's very hard to do. When you talk about Johnny Manziel, the guy's a circus show. He, he is going to sell some seats in the NFL. Oh, wow. But when you look at Johnny Manziel, his, his ability to make you miss at any given point, he's not going to beat you running a straight line. He's going to beat you by running circles around you, making you look slow, and completing just an amazing pass wherever the case may be. He's not the tallest guy in the world, but he has big hands, he has big feet, and he knows how to make the big plays. He knows how to wow people, to capture the attention. He has his charisma about him, and that's what you love about my Johnny Manziel. But Alabama's defense in that game, you have to give credit to, of course, Benny Sinceri and Cyrus Jones for making the two critical interceptions in that game that really put the game away for the Alabama defense. And, of course, you know, poor Jeffrey Pagan and that a sack of Manziel just couldn't get Manziel on the ground. And uh, yeah, Jeffrey Pagan saw himself on SportsCenter's top ten on the wrong side of SportsCenter's top ten for that right there. But, you know, Jeffrey Pagan gave it a great shot. Yeah, Johnny Manziel is going to be fun to watch in the NFL. I don't know necessarily that I want him quarterbacking my team, but he's going to break a lot of ankles, and he's going to, to, to excite a lot of fans on both sides of the football because there's going to be some picks thrown by Johnny Manziel. He's almost like a, a uh, weaker arm version of Brett Favre that's much quicker. Quicker than Favre with the legs, but doesn't nearly have the, the, the arm. Stephen M., we appreciate the insight and the information on uh, Alabama's defense as we get uh, ramped up for spring football there in Tuscaloosa with the Tide. And uh, some questions will be answered, I'm sure, here in March and April as we spring forward and we get back to camp in August. So, again, Stephen M. Smith, certainly uh, join him on his platform, Touchdown Alabama. He also writes for the Houndstooth and also Planet Weekly. Stephen M., thanks so much for joining us, sir. Oh, man, Mark, it's always a joy. Thank you for having me tonight.